Hello and welcome to Nitrania Game Club. My name is Branislav Berec and you're watching Game in a Nutshell, the series of videos designed to teach how to play various board games. Today we're going to learn the game from Alexander Pfister called Expedition to New Dale, which is a sequel to his previous game called Oh My Goods. This is basically a board game version of the Oh My Goods game. It has some story, it has several chapters, and uh, it can very well be played in a solo mode. Basically, this is a game which has almost exact the same rules for the solo game as for the multiplayer game, with very, very, very small changes. So here is how it plays. Expedition to New Dale has a multiple scenarios. This will be the setup for the first chapter. First, take the game board with this A symbol in the bottom left corner. Place this action board next to the game board. Shuffle these bonus tiles face down and randomly select 7 tiles per player. You can put the remaining tiles back into the box. Then start placing these bonus tiles face up on these bonus spaces on the game board and place the first one on the bonus space number 1, second one on the bonus space number 2 and so on and so forth. If you reveal a tile which is already present on the game board, Place it on top of that space. If all bonus spaces are occupied when you reveal a new tile, return that tile back into the box. Continue like this until all tiles have been placed on a game board or returned back into the box. In case you would end up with some unoccupied empty spaces, leave them empty. Shuffle all the general buildings which don't have a number in the bottom right corner, except for these coal mines, and create a face down draw deck. Then create the event deck from these event cards. It will contain seven cards for the seven rounds in the game. First, place the event card number one at the bottom of the deck. In a solo game, place the event card number two at the bottom of the deck. All the event cards are placed face down. The position of these cards in the deck is also indicated by this symbol. Then randomly choose three event cards number 10. Shuffle them and place them on top of the first card. In a solo game, randomly shuffle the three 11 cards and again place them on top of the first card. Then shuffle the cards 100, 101 and 102 and place them on top of the deck. This also applies to the solo game. Return any unused event cards back into the box. Place the newly created event deck next to the game board. Then each player chooses a color. Take one player board of your color with this side up and leave enough space for the cards above and below this player board. Then place these wrench and compensation tokens on the corresponding spaces. Place the action tokens 1 and 2 next to your player board and the action tokens 3 and 4 onto this space of the action board. Then place all these victory point markers on the starting space number 3 of the scoring track. Then take 11 houses of your color and take one of these houses and place it on the starting city of the game which is marked with this S symbol. Then each player has two other components, a bridge and a ship. These are not used in the first chapter, they are only used in some of the later chapters. Then each player takes the starting building, coal mine, and places it above the corresponding space of their player board. Place five good markers on this coal mine, and if there are any unused remaining coal mines, return them back into the box. Shuffle these secret objective cards and deal one of them randomly to each player. Return the rest back into the box. Then each player will draw eight cards from the draw deck. Choose 5 cards to keep and 3 cards are discarded to the discard pile. Create the discard pile next to the draw pile. Take all these colored assistants and put them into the bag. Do not place these black hooded assistants into the bag yet, they are only used in later chapters. Then randomly determine the starting player who would take the bag. That player becomes the starting player for the next round. Place this final scoring card somewhere next to the event deck, together with the chapter 1 main objective card for 2-4 to four players, or this objective card for the chapter 1 for a solo game. Read this previously section from the first chapter, 
then read the main objective for all players and then you're ready to go. In later chapters, based on this table in the rulebook, you would also have to introduce some number of character cards. Take all the characters which are available for that scenario, shuffle them and place number of them face up equal to the number of players in the game. Return the rest of the cards back into the box. Then starting with the last player and going in the counterclockwise direction, each player would pick one card and place it in front of them. In a solo game, shuffle all the available cards, randomly pick two, and of those two you can only choose one. Each chapter of the game is played over seven rounds. Each round has six phases, which are played in this exact order. In the first phase, the event phase, the new event card is revealed. In the second phase, in the planning phase, players will place their action tokens on action spaces either on their player boards or on the action board. In the third phase, the assistant phase, certain number of assistants will be drawn from the back and added to the labor market. Then in the fourth phase, the action phase, Players will take actions. They will start with their action token number 1 and perform the corresponding action, then continue with the action token number 2 and potentially 3 and 4 if they would be placed on the player board or the action board. Then in the fifth phase, the building phase, players will have a chance to build exactly one building and finally in the sixth phase, these special buildings, if they would be placed next to the player board, will be activated. This golden shield is a symbol for victory points and anytime you score this kind of victory points, move your scoring marker on the scoring track immediately. If you pass over a certain threshold, like here between 4 and 5 points, immediately draw 2 more cards from the draw deck and put them into your hand. However, you can only do that when you pass this threshold for the first time. If you reach 50 points and you start moving your marker from this position again, you don't draw any other additional cards. Victory points with this laurel symbol are always scored at the end of the game. In the first phase of the round, reveal the new event card. Either immediately carry out the effect of that card, or, in case like this, note the phase in which the effect would be activated. The second phase, the planning phase, can be actually played simultaneously. All players take all their action tokens and place them either on their player board or on the action spaces on the action board. In the first round, you always have only the action tokens number 1 and 2 available. In later rounds, you may have more tokens at your disposal. Now, you have 8 production areas on your player board, and there are five action spaces on the action board. Only you can use the production areas on your player board, however each production area can contain maximum one of your tokens. The token can be placed on any of these action spaces in a production area, and the position of the token determines how many good markers will be produced on that production building during the action phase. Action spaces on the action board can be used by all players, however each player can have maximum one token on each action space. Now, you are allowed to play an action token on an action space where you cannot take the action right now. However, if you would decide to take this building action first and place the building next to that production area, you will be able to do the production action with the second action token. In the assistance phase, the starting player would draw four assistants from the bag and place them next to the depicted assistants on the current event card. All the assistants, so the assistants depicted on the card and the drawn from the bag, form the labor market for the current round. So in this example we have four yellow assistants, two green assistants, two red ones and one blue assistant. In the fourth phase, the action phase, Starting with the first player, the player with the bag, and then continuing in a clockwise direction, each player removes the first action token, the action token number 1 from the corresponding action space, and performs the action of the action space. Once all players have taken action with their token number 1, 
players start removing the action token number 2 and take actions with their second action token. Then continue like this with the action tokens with number 3 and then action tokens with number 4. For the sake of explanation, I will start explaining the actions with this build action. First, choose one of the cards from your hand. Some events also place buildings into a common display, so when choosing a card to build, you can also choose a card from that display. So let's say this is the card we want to build. First, we need to pay the cost. They're printed in the top left corner and they are in coins, however, players don't have any physical coins. Instead, they pay with these good markers from the production buildings. Each production building can produce goods, which are depicted here, and below is the price in coins of each good marker on that building. So basically, all players start the game with 5 coins. Later in the game, you can pay with good markers from multiple buildings. However, if you take the good marker with the higher value coin and you overpay, you don't get any change back. Then place the building card in any of these unoccupied spaces on your player board. Each area can only have one card and you can freely choose which one to use. If you wouldn't have any of these slots available, you would not be allowed to build another building. If you would build a special building with this black background, as depicted over here, those buildings are placed next to your player board. There, you can have unlimited number of special buildings. Then, whenever you build a building, you must place a house on the game board. You must place it in a town where you don't have a house yet. However, you can only place it maximum two steps away from any town where you already have a house. At the start of the game, you only have the house in the starting town. So let's say two steps away could be over here. Each town can have maximum one house of each color. Your personal supply of houses is limited, so if you wouldn't have any more houses, you would not be allowed to build a building. When you place the house, and you are the first one to place a house in a town, and that town has a bonus depicted on this spot, you take that bonus immediately and mark the victory points on the scoring track. This is called the opening bonus. Then, if the town has any terrain symbols, and you build a house which has the same terrain symbol in the top left corner, you get the depicted discount, which is usually 3 coins. That means, in this example, you would not have to pay 6 coins for a building, but only 3 coins. Then, when you build a house which is only one step away from other town where you already have a house, you may get one bonus tile. You can only take one bonus tile, but you can take it from any adjacent area. So in this example, you can either take this tile or this tile. After choosing one of them, place it in front of you and you can use the bonus of the tile anytime on your turn. You can use it immediately, you can use it in one of your later turns, it's up to you. You can find the explanation of all those bonus symbols in the rulebook. Now, when you increase your range by acquiring this progress tile, you would be allowed to take the bonus tile not only when you move just one step away from the town where you have a house, but also two steps away. You would not be allowed to take the bonus tile if you would move three steps away from the town where you have the house. In other words, if you use the full range, you don't get the bonus tile. Some of the towns have these strange symbols and flags and banners, and these are related to the secret objectives and they are scored at the end of the game. When you take this growth action, you can either pay 7 coins and take the token number 3, or pay 13 coins and you get the token number 4 and also the 3 victory points immediately. You can use those tokens at the start of the next turn. And you can actually get the token number 4 before you get the token number 3. When you take this black market action, first you have to discard two cards from your hand, and then you get four good markers on the coal mine, and one good marker on the card of your choice. You must discard those two cards first, and then you get four good markers on the coal mine, and the fifth one can go either to the coal mine as well, or to any other production building on your player board. When you take this action, the cards action, 
Both parts of the action are optional, however, you have to do them in this exact order. You must choose one card from your hand, and exactly one, keep that card, then discard all other cards in your hand, and draw the same number of cards from the draw pile. After that, draw three additional cards from the draw pile. Since both parts are optional, you don't have to do the first part of the action. If you like all the cards in your hand, you don't have to change them. If the draw deck runs out, shuffle the discard pile and create a new draw deck. When you take this progress action, first you have to pay 4 coins and then you can acquire one progress tile and get two immediate victory points. When you acquire one of these two progress tile, you simply remove it from your player board and then you unlock the special ability under that progress tile. The first one increases your range when you place house on the game board. You increase the range from two steps to three steps. The second progress token reduces the number of cards you have to pay for each missing assistant during the production action, which I'm going to talk about right now. Goods on the production cards can be produced in two ways, either via these assistants or via chaining. To produce goods via assistants, you need the assistants printed on the production card plus or minus the assistants depicted next to the action space where you have the action token. So to produce goods on the skull mine, you would have to have two yellow assistants and one red assistant. However, since you have the action token on this action space, you would need plus one assistant. That assistant can be of any matching color. If you would have the action token on this action space, you would need two more assistants, and again, each of them can be of any matching color. To produce goods on a clay pit, you would need to have two red assistants and one blue assistant. However, since you have the action token on this action space, you would actually need two fewer assistants from those printed on the production card. Those assistants have to be available in the labor market. And don't forget, count all of them printed on the event card and also those that were drawn from the bag. These assistants don't deplete. All of them are available to all players until the end of the round. If you wouldn't have enough assistance, including those you would need because of the position of your action token, the production would fail and you would produce nothing unless you pay the compensation for each missing assistant. If you don't have this compensation token acquired yet, you have to pay three cards from your hand for each missing assistant. Once you acquire this progress token, you only need to pay two cards for each missing assistant. Important note, you may never move your action token to another spot in a production area during the round. Then, if the production is successful, gain the indicated number of good markers from the general supply and place them on the production building. When you plan your production action during the planning phase, Keep in mind that these are the number of assistants of each color in the bag. Now, in addition to the production via assistants, even if that production would actually fail, you can also produce goods via resources. That is called chaining, and to do that, you have to discard cards from your hand, which share the same resource icon as the icon on the production card. For each card discarded, you can place one good marker on that production building. You can discard as many cards as you want, and for each one you can add one more marker to the production card. There is another type of chaining, where instead of discarding the resources from your hand, you have to discard the goods from another production building. Or, in order to produce more valuable goods, you have to discard two types of goods from other production cards. It works in the exact same way as discarding the resources, so to produce meat, you have to discard one good marker from the cattle farm, and then you can add one good marker on the abattoir. You can repeat this as many times as you want. To produce fabrics, you have to discard one yarn and one coal. That means taking one good marker from both production buildings, and then placing only one good marker on the production building which is producing the final product. Then if you produce at least one good marker via chaining, and it doesn't matter if you produce one or more good markers, 
you always get one additional as a bonus. In case you would produce nothing on the production building where you have the action token, because you don't have enough assistance and you also don't have any other resources or goods to produce via chaining, you can draw one card from the draw deck. In the fifth phase of the game, the building phase, starting with the first player and then going in a clockwise direction, each player can build one building. They can do it as if they would have any virtual tokens on the building action space, so all the standard rules for building a building apply. If you don't want to build a building or cannot build a building, draw two cards from the draw deck instead. In the sixth phase of the game, in the phase of the special buildings, again starting with the first player and then going in a clockwise direction, each player may carry out the actions on their special buildings with this sixth symbol. Each card can be activated only once per round. At the end of the round, remove the current event card from play and return all the assistance back into the bag. Pass the bag to the next player in a clockwise direction and that player becomes the new starting player. At the end of the final seventh round, the game will be over. At the end of the game, you can perform one final production via chaining in all of your production buildings in any order you want, however, without the chaining bonus. Players are reminded to do this on the event card for the final round. It is only via chaining, you cannot produce via assistance. Obviously, you can use cards from your hand, so these two cards will fuel the coal mine, these two cards will fuel the cattle farm, and this one can produce one yarn. Then, from these two kettles, I can produce two meats, and one yarn and one coal will produce one fabric. Remember, it's all without the chaining bonus. Special buildings are not production buildings, do not produce additional good markers on these cards. Then proceed to final scoring, and you can use the final scoring card as a help card. First, award victory points for the military. The player with most of these fists will score four victory points, the second player would score two victory points, and a third player would score one victory point. If some of the players would be tied, they all score the higher value, and then the lower value would be skipped. Then score the victory points for the main objective. Main objective is on the mission card. It shows two options, and players can only use good markers from these buildings, either the special building or production building, and they can convert these good markers into coins and score some victory points. You can only choose one option, not both. Even if you would be able to fulfill both of these objectives, you can only choose one of them. Then count the coin value of all your remaining goods on all the buildings, and for each five coins, score one additional victory point. Then score the victory points for your secret objectives. You would score two victory points for each town where you have a house and the town has these symbols. So the white player would score victory points for these flags and for the obelisks, since these are depicted on their secret objective card. Finally, score victory points for your buildings. These are depicted in the top right corner, including the special buildings. Don't count the victory points for the cards in your hand. The player with the most points is the winner. When preparing the game for the next chapters, you can follow the standard setup with the changes for each chapter. You may need to have the different game board, event cards, some additional buildings, characters, and also additional components. You may also need to apply some additional rules from the Chronicles rulebook. I will summarize those additional rules in this chapter. When you need to cross the river without the bridge, you have to pay the depicted resources, and you get these number of victory points immediately, and you can also place your bridge over the river and over the scroll. Then you can build the house on the other side. Now, when other players would wish to cross the bridge and build the house on the other side, they have to give you one card of their choice from their hand. 
otherwise they cannot cross that bridge. Each such space can only contain one bridge, and once you place your bridge, you may not move it any further. These are additional action spaces, and in order to use them, you have to have a house in the corresponding town. You can find the explanation of all these action spaces in the Chronicles book. Some of the roads with this symbol are called difficult roads. In order to pass this road, you have to use this number of steps, so instead of usual one, I have to spend three steps. After taking three steps, I would not be able to take this bonus tile. And don't forget, you can only move three steps once you unlock this wrench progress tile. Similarly, to cross this road and to place a house in this town, you would have to pay this number of coins. Some events will introduce these hooded ones. These are actually not assistants. However, you have to put them into the bag and remove the depicted assistants from the bag back into the box. When you draw them from the bag, they don't come towards the labor market, so you will have fewer assistants available for that round. At the end of the round, return all of them back into the bag. When using ships, you can only move them by using this action. With one arrow, you can move ship by one space. With two arrows, you can move it by two spaces. Every time you move a ship, you get the benefit depicted between the spaces. So with the next step, I will get one good marker of my choice. There is no bonus for the first move and also for moving from the ninth to tenth spot. When you build a house in the town with these dashed lines, you can immediately and only one time pay the depicted resources on one of those lines and get the benefit from the dock space. After that, mark that resource spot with a good marker and it cannot be used again. When playing the 8th Chronicle, use the back side of your player board and start with the coal mine and the captain above their corresponding spaces. Then shuffle these 13 sailor cards and create a separate draw deck which is called the dive bar and then draw the first three cards face up. Place all the ships on the starting space. And again, to move the ship, you need to use this action either by using the action space on the game board or by using the production action on the captain card. For each step, you can move your ship along these dashed lines by one step. At the end of the turn, you can take one bonus tile from the adjacent space. Similar to placing houses into towns, each space can contain any number of ships. If you have a ship on this kind of space with the border, you can place a house in the adjacent town. It costs you two steps. If you would have this wrench progress token acquired and you will be able to move three steps, you would be allowed to take those three steps and build a house in the next town. Once you move the ship to one of these target harbors, it remains there. Unlike these sea spaces, each harbor can only contain maximum one ship. You cannot build a house in these harbors, but you can build houses in the New Dale. As depicted on your player board, if you don't build in the fifth phase, you can either take two cards from the draw deck or you can move your ship one space. There are additional action spaces with the helm symbol on the game board. When you take the action with the help symbol, you can hire a sailor from the dive bar using the standard rules. When you hire these kind of sailors, place them to the right of your player board. When you hire a cook, you can only place him to this spot under your player board. This spot is reserved for the cook and no other building can be placed under this spot. After hiring a sailor or a cook, you can move your ship, but you don't place a house on the game board. Then draw the new card from the deck.